So my name is Sam Chemieski. I'm a trustee of this library. And um, as I thought about this program, and I saw that Marilyn was once again going to, uh, I have to say graces with her presence. I thought back, I couldn't remember how long ago it was, but it happened to have been 1999 when C-SPAN, prior to the internet, I guess, so Zooming or streaming, um, so I got to introduce Marilyn back then. Let's see how, how, how Marilyn has uh, held up as it were. <laughs> Pleasure on behalf of Bexley Public Library to introduce Professor Greenwald. She has been a professor at The Ohio University since 1987, where she teaches journalism. She was formerly a reporter at the Columbus Citizen Journal and the Columbus Dispatch. She and her husband, Tim, live here in Columbus, Ohio. And as a leader, frankly, uh, in journalism and feminist issues in journalism, she took a keen interest in Charlotte Curtis's career. She painstakingly, painstakingly researched just about every aspect of Charlotte's life. She not only focused on her professional career, but also her roots here in Bexley, of which we're of course all very proud. She has prepared a wonderful, wonderful book that chronicles Charlotte Curtis's life from beginning to end. It's not only informative, accurate, and thoroughly done, but it's a joy to read. And I'd ask you to all welcome Marilyn Greenwald, Professor of Journalism at The Ohio University. There we go. That is Professor Greenwald. Okay. Eunice Hunton Carter, a lifelong fight for social justice, is newly out, has already won the American Publishers Award for Best Biography of the Year. I can assure you, although you have not had the opportunity to yet read it, it's provocative, it's well done, it's intuitive. It's, as I said 27 years ago, a joy to read. Um, Marilyn is recently retired from OU, and she explores issues of race, issues of feminism, issues of courage, uh, all in a very, very wonderful and readable book, which I hope everybody will take the opportunity to purchase and enjoy. So on behalf of the trustees and the library, Professor Green. All right. Thanks, Sam, for the wonderful introduction <laughs> today and 20, was it 21 years ago also. So, um, yeah, what, what I'll do is I, I do want to talk about Eunice Carter and, and we were talking with Sam a couple minutes ago, and I'll get to this in the talk, but what is really compelling, I think, about Eunice's story is not just Eunice, but her family. She she has this incredible family, which I hope I can, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to tell you everything about them just because of time. But as, as I was researching this, my husband, you know, who, who was reading the drafts, um, knew about Eunice, but not about her family. And in the middle of it, he said, wow, this is, it's almost like roots in that it was this, this kind of family that had gone through a lot, but really thrived and they served as, as kind of um, trailblazers. So we'll get to that, you know, as we go on, but I'll give you what the headline of who Eunice was and then get to some of the more, um, some, some of the things we found. And in a nutshell, Eunice was the only woman and the only person of color on the team that prosecuted Lucky Luciano and the mob in 1936. And this was, you know, they called it the trial of, of the century, which there were a lot of trials of the century, but, it, but that speaks to how important it was back in 1935 and 1936 and the, and the you know, the coverage that it got. And um, this, was, this was an amazing achievement for not just a woman to be on the team, but a woman of color, you know, it, it was mostly white guys. And I'll tell you how we even found out about Eunice. Um, it was just a fluky thing. We were at the Mob Museum. If you're not familiar with the Mob Museum in Las Vegas, you have to go. It, it is a serious museum. It's, it's a wonderful museum, um, not on the Strip, but, but in downtown Las Vegas. And we were in Las Vegas at a wedding and we had some time to kill. And we were like, what do we want to do for you know three or four hours? And just by a stroke of luck, there happened to be a review in the New York Times that day of the Mob Museum in Las Vegas. And it was this review that said, this is just a, a wonderful museum, you know, you've got to go. So he said, let's go. And, and, and if you do go, leave about three or four hours because it's huge, a huge museum. But anyway, 
we were having a lot of fun. We were looking at the history of the mob. And then we, we went into this little room where it talks about Lucky Luciano. And let me, let me see if I can. Yeah, there he is. Um, <laughs> famous mug chat. It was talking about Lucky Luciano and the mob. And they talked about this team of 20 attorneys and they were considered the best attorneys in New York and possibly the country. And they were head, head by um, Thomas Dewey, who you might know as later as, as he ran for president. But at this point, he was a special prosecutor out to get the mob. So they had these photos of all the guys on the team, you know, and they were framed. And you can imagine it was, you know, white guy, white guy, white guy, white guy. And they were youngish, most of them. And then right in the middle of in the team, there was this black woman. And, I, you know, we, I turned to my husband. I said, there's got to be a story behind that. You know, but I was working on something else at the time, but I thought, how on earth did this happen in an era of racism and sexism, you know, um, but anyway, so that was put on, <laughs> on hold for a while. And then a couple years later, I contacted the mob museum and I didn't even know her name. And I said, who was that person? And can you tell me again, you know, anything more? And they said, yeah, not only was she on the team, that that prosecuted the mob, she was actually responsible for making the link and getting the actually getting the evidence, which I'll get to later, that prosecuted the mob. So so it was more than just she was on the team. She was a pivotal member of the team. So that's how that's how it got started. Now, and before I talk about, about her, I started you know trying to find out about Eunice. Well, who was she? Did anybody write about her? And the bottom line was she was in a few anthologies of, you know, people. She had a short New York Times obituary, which means she was somebody, I guess. But there wasn't a lot on her. So that was a good thing. The bad thing is there wasn't a lot on her. So what do you write about? I mean, you know, could this be more than just a magazine article if you don't have a lot? She was born in 1899. So a lot of her well, all of her contemporaries were gone. She had grandchildren and great grandchildren, um, but you know nobody you could really interview per se who was there. It was not. It just didn't look good. So I was working with a graduate student of mine who now works at CNBC, and she was really a good grad student. I said, you know, this is an interesting topic. I just don't know what to do because I can't find anything else on her. And so my grad student, Yoon, who is my co-author on this, you know, we're chatting and she said, well, let me look into this. So she does a little research and she said, you know, Eunice Hunton, when she was, you know, in her twenties and just graduated from Smith College. And this is another thing you can imagine in the twenties, um, a black woman at Smith College. I mean, there were some, but very few, she graduated with two degrees, a master's degree and a, and a bachelor's degree. Well, anyway, she was doing some writing for a freelance um, kind of arts magazine. And my co-author and former student, Ewan said, you know, I dug up some of her writing and look at this. And, and it was fiction and it was uh, short stories and it was reviews. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, this is seriously good writing. I mean, this isn't an amateur who's talented. This is somebody who's a seriously good writer. So we started doing a little more research on her. Then we found out about Tom Dewey, who was the special prosecutor. So Ewan decides, let, let me go to the archive of Tom Dewey and see what I can find out, which is in Rochester, New York. And she finds out that when Tom Dewey decided to get the mob, you know, he was like the the Robert Mueller of his day, <laughs> he decides to get the mob. And what does he do? As soon as he's named to get the mob, everybody's you know, calling him and you know, the, the newspapers, because that's newspapers and radio were primarily the, the, the media at the point. And they're like, we wanna know all about this. And they're bugging him, they're bugging him, they're bothering him. So Tom Dewey arranges meetings with some publishers of the era one by one takes them to lunch, whatever, and says to them, if you leave us alone and our big, you know, you know, investigation of the mob, just leave us alone, give us a year, we will tell you everything we have once we're willing to go public. And these publishers agreed to that. 
And you and you know, we got little we got little um, memos from these publishers saying, yeah, that looks <laughs> that looks good. And we and you and I were laughing because we said, can you imagine CNN, you know, Mueller going to CNN or MSNBC, just leave us alone. And in a year, we'll, we'll tell you everything you want to know. But they agreed to it. So, so, so I guess my point is gradually these things were, you know, these facts were building up, these interesting stories were building up about what was going on here. Now, so, so Dewey decides, all right, he, he gathers this team of what he says are the best attorneys in New York. She's one of them. He names a couple Jewish attorneys, which was well, was unheard of then. You know, you would not you would not name an, a Jewish attorney because of the anti-Semitism of the era. So he said, "I just want the best. It doesn't really matter to me." So in this way, Dewey was a, was was a little bit ahead of his time because he you know he, it didn't he said it didn't matter to him. It didn't matter to him. Well, what happened was he gave a radio address. Um, before the team started doing its investigation. And this was the most wonderful address you ever heard. I, I didn't hear it, but I read the transcript. And in it, he told everybody in New York, the mob affects everything you do. Every step you take, everything you eat is, uh, is affected directly or indirectly by the mob. So he really was ahead of his time when it came to marketing when it came to you know getting people interested in what he was doing so this was essentially the person who you know led this investigation now tom dewey um was a fascinating character and what really interested you and i about this you had three really brilliant people who were working together, working against each other. You had Thomas Dewey, who was this talented attorney um, and pretty wily. I mean, who else would meet with publishers and say, leave us alone and we'll, we'll give you everything. Who else would have a radio announcement and you know, say, this is how the mob affects you. You had Eunice, who we'll get to about you know, how brilliant she was. And then you had Lucky Luciano and the mob. And a lot has been written about Luciano. Um, he was also brilliant. I mean, we did, we did a lot of research on the mob of the era. And Luciano, all these people, all three of these people were in their 30s at the time. So they were young. In fact, there was, they were very close in age, three, four, five years difference in, in all three of them. Luciano is credited with kind of bringing the mob into the current age. So in the, in the mid twenties, late twenties, Luciano was kind of a middling player, but he felt the mob was in the stone age, right? He wanted to bring it to current times. And um, he wanted, he's credited really with actually forming organized crime because he organized it. He was the one, he said at one point, you know, I want it to be like the A&P, which was a huge chain of grocery stores or, or U.S. Steel. He, he pretty much, once he got power, um, you know, turned the mob into essentially a conglomerate, you know, a, a company, a, a pretty brutal company. But anyway, brilliant guy, very dapper, wore, you know, whatever it was, $800 shoes or, or what they were, would have been $800 shoes, you know, in today's in today's money, very expensive suits, and kind of a, and let me, I'll go backwards. I mean, in a weird way, he's kind of a handsome guy. I mean, he's very craggy looking, but I mean, he's, he had the thick, thick black hair, you know, you know, dressed well. So, so he was a, he was a pretty interesting character, but what Dewey did, people outside of the mob really didn't know that much about Lucky Luciano in 1935. You, you knew him if you were in the mob, you didn't know him if you weren't in the mob. So another kind of clever thing that Dewey did, he knew there had to be a symbol of the mob. It can't be the mob. It has to be a person who represents the mob. So he took Lucky Luciano and kind of made him a symbol of the mob. Um, he became kind of the person that he wanted everyone to hate. So he represents the mob. So all this was going on um, you had three really brilliant people 
kind of up, up against each other. I mean, Dewey and, and Eunice, of course, weren't against each other, but um, you know, they, they were part of a team that, that got Luciano. One thing, and I, I, I have given a couple other talks on this and I, I keep forgetting to say it. One thing that, that Luciano, I guess there was a lesson if you worked with Luciano, be careful if you were his friend <laughs> because he would very quickly turn on you and, and, and have you murdered. Um, he was, when he was in his mid, um, late twenties, he worked for a mob boss. I don't remember his name. He's, he's not a, he's not a well-known name. And, uh, another mob boss said, Hey, work for me. Don't work for the other guy. So Luciano had a hit on the first boss. All right. He goes to work for the second boss. Things are going okay. Then he, they have an argument. So he gets a hit on the second boss. <laughs> so you know, you, you couldn't, you know, the, the old saying, there's no honor among thieves. You, you couldn't trust Luciano because even if he worked for you, if you had a, a bad a, a disagreement, you, you were history according, you know, with Luciano. But anyway, so we'll put that on hold for a minute. And I just want to talk a little bit about um, Eunice's background. Now, Eunice uh, was born in 1899 in Atlanta. And she comes from this incredible background, her parents and her grandfather. Stanton Hutton, who's on the left there, is Eunice's grandfather, and he was a slave in Virginia. Um, he bought his freedom, moves, starts moving north. And, you know, you have to remember shortly after the Civil War, if, if you were, even if you bought your freedom, you weren't safe. So he immediately starts heading toward Canada, goes, goes to Canada, um, moves to this little enclave about 90 miles north of um, Detroit called Chatham. And Chatham was this little village. It was almost like this artsy, businessy village of former slaves. And they became um, you know, evolutionists. They, they formed this little arts community. They formed businesses. And Stanton Hutton had, I think it was nine children. Um, and he became wealthy. He started owning real estate, really a, also a very smart, a smart guy. And that's, that's Stanton over there. And look, you know, we, we went to Chatham and there's a museum all about the Chatham of the era. That's where we got his picture. And I'll tell you, if you're ever in Detroit, drive the hour and a half north. It's, it's fascinating, this museum. I mean, in addition, it's not obviously not all about Eunice's family, but, but they have, you know, the shack, they have shackles that, you know, it tells the story of slavery and really, really in a chilling way. Um, and it, it shows how these people, they formed this wonderful little community. Of course, it had to be in Canada at the time, um, and they fought to, to, to free the slaves in the United States. Well, anyway, so there's Stanton. William Hutton is one of his children. Um, I think it was his second or third youngest. William Hutton is Eunice's father. And what's really fascinating about William, and, and you know, this is another fascinating story. William, um, Stanton Hutton really strongly believed in education. All right, you know, he, the only way to, you know, you have to be educated. Um, so he, he went to college, but he wasn't sure what he was gonna do after college. He, had, he was active in the YMCA just in Canada, just cause he liked it, you know? Well, the people at the Y, he, he formed groups at the Y and he became a little leader, you know, just, just joining the Y. The people at the international YMCA took note of him and they said, you know, will you work for us? He ended up working for the International YMCA, rose in the ranks in Canada and becomes what they call a general secretary, which is one of the, you know, it's like a cabinet member. It's one of the high ranking uh, members. He was, he was the first person of color who was, who was you know, in a, in a high ranking position at the International YMCA. So what do they do? They said, you know, we want to integrate the Ys. This was what year, probably about the 1870, 1880s, they wanted to integrate the Ys in the United States. They wanted to integrate the Ys in the Southern United States. So they give William the task 
of going down south in the, in the US, and I'm only chuckling because you can imagine what this must have been like for somebody who was black to integrate the wise in, in, in the Southern United States. And so he go, he's a young man, he goes down there, he meets, um, he meets a woman named Addie. And Addie, Addie actually was, um, she, she, she was well-to-do, her father was well-to-do. She traveled all over, well, I shouldn't say all over the world. She had gone to Europe. She also valued education and her parents. If he meets Addie, he marries Addie. Um, Addie was also brilliant. She was a writer, you know, at a time, again, when a lot of Black people didn't go to college, she went to college. And we'll get to this business about World War I in a minute. But he meets Addie. And at the time, he's traveling through the South, trying to integrate the wise and actually being pretty successful at it. Although his, 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 his I call them adventures, but, but that's not really accurate because, because they were, he, the obstacles that he overcame in the Jim Crow South, you can imagine trying to integrate the wise. He was quite successful. If you look at a history of the YMCA, of the international YMCA anywhere, you will see William Hunton. He was, he was, he's considered one of the top, you know, people in the history of the YMCA. But anyway, um, I was looking, his, his letters are at Howard University. He wrote hundreds of letters to Addie when he was traveling through the South, literally hundreds. And he, he was saying, you know, a, a lot of times he, he, they wouldn't let him on a train or if he went on a train, he had to go in the back you know, just some, some of the things that he, he faced while traveling in the South. And he was a little bit surprised, not to say there wasn't racism in Canada because there was, but it was nothing like what he faced in the South when he moved there. But he, he traveled and he wrote hundreds of letters to Addie. Addie helped him and, and traveled a little bit with him, but then, then in 1899, Eunice was born and three years later, Eunice's brother was born. So she didn't travel then, but anyway, Brilliant guy, very successful. Um, he unfortunately died relatively young. He was in his 50s um, of tuberculosis. So Addie was on her own. At this point, Eunice was about to enter, enter college. And so what does Addie do, all right? You know, she's a writer. Addie was one of these people who thought, you know, Black people in particular had had to write things down because there was no, you know, there's no history. There's very little history. Um, a lot of, you know, most of the slaves, you know, they wouldn't teach them how to read and write. So she really valued the written word. She decides to volunteer to um, go to France at the end of World War I to, to aid the Black soldiers there. Um, and she wrote a book about it. I read the book and, and again, fascinating account of her year and a half or so in France at the end of World War I, giving aid to black soldiers there. And I mean, if I were to summarize, I, you know, I think what she found was that the people in France for the most part respected the black soldiers in many ways more than the people in the United States did, you know, which is, a, which is another story, but, but um, you know, the segregation of, of people who were serving their country uh, astounding, but but again, her book, she thought it absolutely vital that she get this in writing, and it is an interesting book. If you, and it's, I mean, you can still get it. We got it. But anyway, that's Addie. Um, okay, so here's Eunice. Eunice goes to Smith College. This is her yearbook photo, 1921. She gets a master's degree and a bachelor's degree at the same time. She's definitely an overachiever. I got a copy of her master's thesis and what she did for her master's thesis, she, re she, she took a city, a, a city government and she totally reorganized a city government. In other words, she, she um, was, was almost, you know, she, she, you know, different departments, different agencies, what each agency would do. Um, budgets for each agency. So, so this is something that somebody who was like 22 years old did. I was looking at this and this looked like somebody who was a seasoned, you know, political person would have, would have written this thing. So, so right then, you know, very smart. But what, one of the things that she loved to do was write. 
Um, and I think I mentioned she did that freelance writing for that one publication. And it was great writing, so great that, that she became actually an active member of the Harlem Renaissance. And if you, if you know what that is, it was during this era, it was, it was kind of arts, business, community. She moved to Harlem and was, was kind of a name in the Harlem Renaissance. And her writing was really respected. I mean, and it should have been, I thought it was great. I mean, it, it, it was a genuine professional writer, not just somebody who was trying to be a writer. But anyway, after she graduated, she becomes a social worker. She lives in Harlem. Um, okay, so we're getting a little bit ahead. So she's in her early 30s decides to go to night, night law school. She goes to Fordham University at night. By this point, she's married. Uh, she married a dentist, Lyle Carter. They have, a, they have one son. She goes to law school. It took her a couple years to graduate. She becomes a lawyer. And here's where things start to heat up as far as her career. Um, I believe it was in 1935, there was a race riot terrible race riot in Harlem. And it was one of the first, it was the first or one of the first. And so Fiorello LaGuardia, the, the mayor, um, names a commission to decide what is the, what started this? How do we avoid another one? He knows she's a lawyer. It was a committee, I think of five white people, five black people or six and five, whatever it was, it was, um, blacks and whites, and he names her secretary of the committee, which means she's kind of in charge. She get, they gather all this information. She gets to the point where she organizes it and turns it into legislation, proposals that she takes to Albany. And, and there were four bills passed because essentially, I don't want to say just because of Eunice, but she's the one that did, did, most, <laughs> did a lot of the work. And most of them had to do with equal housing and equal education, which it seems now like, well, of course, but back then, no, people didn't realize the extent of how, of the housing problems and, and unequal education. So, so this is how actually um, Dewey got, got to know her because she was quoted in the newspaper. She, she got to be well, kind of well-known in the community and in Harlem. So this is how Dewey, um, names her to the Luciano, to you know, one of the top attorneys in New York City. So she's, she and the 20 other attorneys meet at the Woolworth building, um, you, know, at top, you know, top secret, and they start their investigation of the mob. All right, so Eunice, um, when she was an attorney, she worked briefly for this, for, as a, in the prosecutor's office in what they called women's court, which was mostly prosecution of prostitutes. And she notices that a lot of the prostitutes who, who didn't have any money, as you can imagine, a lot of them were drug addicts. They had the same high priced attorneys and bail bondsmen. All right. She said, well, how do, how did these, these prostitutes, you know, how did they afford these high priced attorneys? So she suddenly, she comes to the realization or she thinks maybe they're getting the money from the mob. Now you have to remember the mob at this time, it wasn't thought that they were involved in prostitution, that that wasn't an issue. In fact, even, even Dewey said, we're not gonna get in the prostitution. The mob has nothing to do with prostitution. These poor women, I don't wanna be seen as, you know, trying to, you know, prosecute these poor, poor prostitutes. Well, anyway, she, Dewey says, no, we're not going to do that. The mob has nothing to do with prostitution. Well, she persuades them and she persuades an assistant to Dewey. Yes, this is the way it is. Dewey believes her. Well, that cracked open the case because then the prostitutes were the ones that testified against the mob because they were the ones that were in the room, supposedly when the mob, you know, when they were making their plans. So um, essentially, when she, when they came up with this idea of the mob and prostitution, that cracked the case. Um, okay, so when she was named to the to Dewey's team, it made all the newspapers. This was just one. Um, Mrs. Patterson is only a appointee. Um, 
Amsterdam News. The Amsterdam News was a black newspaper, it, well, is a black newspaper in New York City. And another kind of sub story in the case, you know, in our, in our book is we talk a little bit about these black newspapers all over the country. At the time, the main, a lot of the mainstream newspapers in this country, they didn't cover black people, or if they did, it was in relation to crime or something. They just didn't. So what black people got, you know, news about what they were doing and news of interest them through a series of, I don't know, half dozen or maybe more black newspapers throughout the country. New York had a couple, um, Pittsburgh, uh, Baltimore, and these, these were the, the papers that, that you read that, that someone like Eunice would be the subject of a story. Even if she was in New York, they would write about her in, at the Pittsburgh Courier, for instance, which was a black newspaper in Pittsburgh. So, so the, the whole history of the black newspapers is really compelling because it, it really let people know, hey, black people, they're people of accomplishment, the way they lived, other than just in terms of crime. But her appointment made all the newspapers, well, I shouldn't say that, we didn't see all of them, at least most of the newspapers in New York. Um, okay, Co <laughs> Cokie Flo Brown was a prostitute and she was one of the, the key witnesses, that's, that's her mugshot. Um, one another thing that Eunice did that really helped the prosecution is you can imagine here they're rounding up all these prostitutes, all right, and they were scared. You know, they weren't going to make the best. You know, when they took the stand, they were scared. But but it was Eunice who talked to them. Eunice who really helped them out. They they trusted Eunice. Eunice was extremely soft spoken. She was very low key. That was that was just her personality. But anyway, so she also served as kind of this liaison between this, this whole group of white guys and, you know, who were trying to prosecute Luciano and um, the, the prostitutes. So the trial takes place, um, Luciano, okay. <laughs> a couple of things, and, and if you're an attorney, you, you, you know, you might be interested in this. So Luciano is found guilty. You can see this. Um, Dewey, you know, make Dewey makes his case. Um, now, after the trial, okay, I think it was 30 to 50 years. I don't know if it's in it, 30 years, I think that Luciano got specifically. Um, but after the trial, a couple things happened. First of all, the prostitutes recanted some of their stories. They said, you know, we said we were in the room with these guys, but we weren't. It didn't matter. They want you. Know, there was no retrial. There was like rampant wiretapping. And I say rampant wiretapping because now there are specific stipulations on wiretapping, right? Back then, do we et cetera, just they wiretap whenever they wanted. <laughs> that's how they got a lot of their, um, you know, that's what they used to, to convict. And also they had what they called a blue ribbon jury. What's a blue ribbon jury? Okay, Dewey wanted a blue ribbon jury and got it. A blue ribbon jury at the time was made up of people who, first of all, people who served on juries before. So when they were picking the jury, they could ask, well, you wanted a jury before. And if, if, they, if you were, you know, he picked you. So what does this mean? It means that the jury is essentially made up of white people and essentially of men. So it was a, a jury essentially of white people and men. That was called a blue ribbon jury. Not ju jury. Now these are illegal, of course. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't pick. So there were a lot of things that were, were real iffy about the prosecution of Lucky Luciano, but it, um, but anyway, but, but it never, you know, it, it didn't overturn the, the prosecution and he was sent to jail. Now, a couple things um, that I wanna say about Addie because I, I don't, I wanna talk more about, there, there's a twist ending here to the whole Luciano thing. I, some people here might know what it is. I didn't know and a lot of my friends didn't. There, there is a twist, which I'll get to in a minute, but he, let me just say this. Luciano did not die in jail. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll, I'll tell you what happened. Um, Addie, what, what, I, I have to talk about Addie briefly because Addie was a role model for her daughter, Eunice. And Addie was um, very active in the women's club movement in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. 
um, and Black Women's Club movement in particular. And this was a this this was a very active group of people. They got legislation passed before women got the vote. They you know, obviously women in there couldn't vote, but they were very active in lobbying. They they in, in education and feeding the poor. She was one of the founders um, of the National Association of Colored Women, which was a big, big um, organization back in the, well, probably the first 25, 30 years of the 20th century. She did a lot of writing. Um, she was active in the, in the YMCA, the international YMCA, like her husband. So I, you know, I have said somebody should do a book on Addie because Addie was one of these kind of unsung heroes who, who, who really made a contribution, but you just, you just don't really know much about her, but she was a role model for, for Eunice. Okay, so, so that backpedaling a little bit. So um, Luciano is, is found guilty. Dewey, Dewey's stock just rises, all right? Dewey becomes, he was a special prosecutor. He became prosecutor from prosecutor. And you may know Dewey was um, a governor of New York. Dewey becomes the three, three term governor of New York very active in the Republican party. He, he was a Republican. Now, what happened to Eunice? After the prosecution, Eunice is, is named to head one of the divisions of the prosecutor's office. Dewey totally revamps the New York prosecutor's office. He just you know, changes the way it's organized. She is named head of one of the, one of the units. There was, a, there was a story in one of the papers, I don't remember we have it, and it said, she, she, what it said was, her, her salary and it, she was one of the highest, she became one of the highest paid attorneys in New York. So she became kind of a mini star, all right? People kind of knew who she was. But Dewey, of course, this, this just made his career. You know, nobody, nobody outside of New York or even in, in a lot of places in New York would know who Dewey was, but he, he became a national figure and a star. You know, he was kind of the star prosecutor after this. Um, she actually was, um, she, she worked with Dewey on all his campaigns. She worked with him in his gubernatorial campaigns and, and his presidential campaigns. Um, she, she really helped him try to get the black vote. Dewey was really, he, he talked a lot about how he was an equal opportunity candidate he, you know, he didn't care what someone's race was. He didn't care what your religion was. I mean, this was kind of Dewey's, Dewey's claim to fame. Um, however, he, you know, he never really named, he never named Eunice to any, any higher office. When he was governor, he could have named her to a judgeship and to some, some, you know, kind of state cabinet posts, which he never did. No, we have no, we haven't, we found letters between the two. We have no evidence that she was mad about this or that she didn't like it. But, but the point is he could have, and he didn't. She remained incredibly loyal to uh, Dewey pretty much her whole life. Dewey was a Republican. She was a Republican. And if you know anything about, you know, history of, of the parties, a lot of black people who were Republicans switched when FDR became president, he, he, they became Democrats. She never did. She, she remained a steadfast Republican all of her life, whether she did it because she believed in it or because of, of Dewey, I don't know. But this incredible um, loyalty that she felt for Dewey pretty much lasted her whole life. And of course, he, he, he never made it to be president of the United States. Um, this is the, <laughs> the famous, the famous picture when he was running against Truman and was supposed to win. In fact, we were, we were reading about this, this race and it was like a no brainer. Everybody knew Dewey was gonna win. And so it was this incredible, um, you know, when this happened and this, this is why it became such a famous, famous photo. But anyway, so she goes into private practice. Uh, I don't know, four, five, six years after um, she's in the prosecutor's office. And then she, she becomes kind of an internationalist. If, if you know who um, Mary, Mary um, McLeod Bethune is, she worked with Eleanor Roosevelt 
in the Roosevelt administration. She worked with her, she do, um, I'm sorry, Eunice works with some of the people who uh, at the signing of the UN charter in the late 1940s, she travels overseas a lot. She, she you know, she actually um, became kind of a, I don't know if it was official or unofficial attorney for the UN for a while. So in a way she followed her mother's footsteps. She, she donated some time, some of her time in her legal expertise and be, became an internationalist work for the, the United Nations. I have a tape of an interview show that Eleanor Roosevelt had where she talks to Eunice about, you know, anti-colonialism and, and um, working overseas. Now, one last thing, and I'll open it for, question, um, for questions. So Lucky Luciano was sentenced to 30 to 50 years, but he ended up dying in Italy, all right? Didn't die in jail, didn't die in the United States. You might say, well, wow, wow you know, 50 years, that would make him like 85 years old if he served those sentences. What happened was he served 10 years, okay? 10 years of a 30 to 50 year sentence. Why? Well, in the mid 40s, or I guess early 40s, after he was sentenced, you know, it starts the breakout of World War II. And the docks in New York, um, a lot of the dock workers were Italian immigrants. So the powers that be in New York or Washington or wherever were worried about sabotage from these Italian dock workers and Mussolini. So they got a pledge from um, from Luciano, who still had a lot of control of the mob, as you, you can imagine, to say, please tell these dock workers, you know, not, not to sabotage the US. In other words, the mob said, okay, you know, if you promise to release Luciano from prison, we'll control the dock workers and there will be no sabotage. And indeed that happened. And I believe it was 46, he served 10 years, he was freed. He was deported to Italy. He didn't want to go to Italy. He wanted to stay in the United States. He was deported to Italy and they said, you may not come back to the United States. They wouldn't let him even though he wanted to come back. And that was the story. Amazingly enough, after all this, he ended up serving 10 years of his sentence. Um, but one last thing and I'll open it to questions. He did end up coming back to the United States in a box after he died, he said, I want to go back to, um, to the United States, to New York. And I want, he wanted to be buried in Queens in that cemetery called St. John Cemetery, where a lot of the mob is buried. Um, I guess they have mob tours there. It, I, I, we didn't go, but in Queens. And one last final piece of irony here, Lucky Luciano apparently is buried in St. John Cemetery about four rows away from one of the one of the mob leaders that he put a hit on, like you know when he, when he was in his twenties. So so they one of the guys that that he was supposed to be loyal to, and of course wasn't loyal to, put a hit on him. So these guys are like spending eternity now, you know, in this cemetery in, in the Queens. So anyway, I'll end I'll end it on on that on that note. And if anybody's got any questions. So I'm curious when they released him from prison, was there some, I assume they did, they weren't that blunt in explaining why they were letting him out. Was there some sort of cover story or public explanation for his release or? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, from what I can tell, and, and there's different, it's funny you would ask that because there are different accounts in, of this. I read Dewey's memoir and Dewey's memoir is different than some of the, you know, histories of the mob that you read. And, and from what I can tell, no, they didn't try to whitewash it or say, oh, he escaped or, you know, make up something. The, the only thing is, the only difference is Dewey says, I didn't make a deal with the mob. The governor of, of New York at the time, Lehman, his name was, made the deal. I'm just honoring the deal. And then other people say, no, Dewey was actually behind the deal and then honored the deal. So, so it's still it's still vague, but as far as I can tell, they didn't, they, they were honest. I mean, he was, in fact, I think, actually my co-author would know more about this. 
I think there was actually this little celebration when he was being deported. I mean, we, we have pictures of, of people, you know, <laughs> waving goodbye to him. So, so they're absolutely, they were absolutely truthful about, about what happened. Um, did Eunice like have to offer protection to the prostitutes and because to, to go and testify against the mob, I would be concerned. And then also the jurors, I would think, um, was there like protection for these people or? Yeah, from what I could tell now, the, the, um, the prostitutes were kept in custody. So, I mean, so during the trial, they weren't let out. Um, now, as far as the, the, the safety of everybody, what, what, I, what we read, and this is kind of answer your question, but not exactly. Um, one of the things that Dewey, Dewey said when he was named special prosecutor was, if you have information about the mob, we will protect you. Because he said in the past, people had information, but they were afraid to give it because obviously they were afraid of getting killed. So, so there were different steps he took and he made a big deal out of this. We will protect you, we will protect you, you know, you won't have to worry. So he, he knew about that. Now, one thing I will, you just jogged my memory about something. Eunice had one child, a boy, and her husband was from Barbados. I mean, he lived, you know, in the United States. He, he you know, when he moved to the United States and met her and they lived there. But her, her son, spent a lot of time, a lot of his childhood in Barbados with relatives. And she said it was, you know, she works and she's got, he's got relatives there. But, but the word kind of was that she was worried, you know, when she was a prosecutor, that she was a little bit worried about her son and his safety. I don't know. She never said that in interviews. She always said, hey, he's got relatives there. You know, he's got two parents that work. But this issue of safety, I think, was you know, certainly on everybody's mind. And certainly it was on um, Dewey's mind. And then he, one of the reasons they had their headquarters in the Woolworth building in Manhattan, which is a huge building, because there were a bunch of other offices there. So if, if you were seen going in the Woolworth building, you could be going anywhere, you know, I mean, so, so you weren't necessarily going to the headquarters of Dewey. So, so they, they worked these things out, being well aware of, of the security issues. Do you know if uh, Eunice faced any discrimination because of her race? I mean, well, her sex also. I mean, it was just rare for women to be attorneys back then, let alone Black women. And I just find it amazing that she can just go in and the only thing she's worried about is mob violence. Uh, you know, I, I can't even see the white prostitutes, you know, cough, like I would think their attitude would be, who does this uppity Black woman think she is? I mean, I just, it's completely amazing to me that she could just face no recrimination for being a black woman in such a high powered position. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, one, I mean, I, we didn't find anything in her letters. Now, obviously we haven't read all her letters. So that's, you know, we don't know what we don't know. One, one of the um, big articles that I read in doing this research was in Ebony magazine in the well, 40s, I guess. And it was an article strictly about black women attorneys. And it was, and, and you know, I don't remember the numbers, but at the time there were like 50 or 60 black women attorneys in the country. And I think this was in the forties that the article was written. And a couple interesting things, they were saying, first of all, that, uh, that, that I don't know if they call it discrimination, but there's certain jobs that these black women attorneys were given. You know, they, they involved children, they, they involved the women, you know, they, they were not given top jobs where, you know, criminal attorneys, um, that kind of thing. And they, they seem to think there were certain, you know, jobs that we have, even as attorneys. Second thing, um, the second thing is that they, they didn't have the organization, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a vicious circle, you know, they, you know, attorneys um, network, they know each other. So they didn't have the ability to network per se, because there were not many women attorneys, there were not many black attorneys, there were not many black women attorneys. So, so it just, you know, it was much harder in that respect. One of the attorney, well, actually a couple of attorneys said something that I thought was interesting. They said, it's harder being a woman attorney than it is being a black. In other words, they felt more discriminant. And I don't know if, you know, 
if this is true or what, if there's, if, you know, but they said it's harder for them to be women as attorneys back in the 40s than to be black, you know, that they felt that that was, was holding them back more, which I thought was, I, that stuck in my mind. That was, that was pretty interesting, but no, you're right. And I mean, Eunice, um, I mean, even law schools, we did a little bit of research on, on law schools. I, I don't remember the dates, but up until like the thirties in the, you, there were law schools in the North open to black people, but not in the South. Um, and in fact, it was Thurgood Marshall who, who was one of the people that opened up law schools to black people in the South. But so, so even going to law school in this country up until whenever the thirties was, was rough, you know, you, you couldn't do it. So, so yeah, it's an excellent, it's an excellent question. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons Eunice got the, you know, the media coverage that she did because it was so unusual, but she was very low key, you know, um, I, I don't want to get too much into this, but as we were writing our book, we found out that actually Eunice's grandson was doing a book on her. This was just a fluky thing that, that we, we found out about. And her grandson, who actually is a Yale, a professor of law at Yale, he's, he, in his book about her, he seems to think there was a lot of discrimination against her. And I mean, a lot of this comes from talking to his father, who was Eunice's son. He knew Eunice a little bit. I think Eunice died when he was 12 or 13. And so he had some conversations with her. So this is what's really, what's really unknown. But Eunice was not, you know, vocal in, in any way about that. But, but we don't know how she felt. I mean, and the fact that Dewey, could Dewey have appointed her to a judgeship or something when he was governor or to an agency? Yeah, he could have, but he didn't. You know why? I mean, who knows? So, so yeah, that's that's actually a very good question. Um, you know, one thing, and just as an aside, I thought that the research we did about Dewey was fascinating. I mean, I told my husband, I said, I can't believe Dewey was never president of the United States. I mean, the stuff that this guy did um, and what he was involved in was amazing. I, in his memoir, he says that Nixon wanted to name him to the Supreme Court, and he turned it down. You know, which is just kind of an interesting fact. Um, but he was he was a kind of an advisor to the Republican Party. Even he he died. I think he was in his late sixties. He wasn't that old, but but he was kind of an informal advisor to the Republican Party even after he retired. But anyway, that's kind of a, a different topic. But I'm curious now. How long did her son live then? Her son, who who is no no longer around, he I can't remember how old he was, but he was quite something in his own right. He was an attorney. He served. Oh, was it the Johnson administration? He certainly remember the old health, education, and welfare department, the cabinet. He wasn't a, he wasn't a cabinet secretary, but he was pretty high ranking in HEW. And he was the first president of the uni, was it, University of DC, of University of Washington, DC in, in Washington. Um, I don't know, I don't know how long he lived, but he certainly lived long enough to be, um, you know, to, to do a lot. And he ended up, boy, he had four or five kids, but he was, he, her son was the only one. He, he was an only child, but I'm glad you brought that up because I, I did want to mention that her son, you know, was really did a lot in his life too and was also an attorney. Well, thank you. Thanks. I appreciate it. This was a great talk. Thank you. These were really, really good questions. Um, and, and like I said, th there's so many, there's so many dimensions to her life that we, we just scratched, we scratched the surface, you know, fascinating person. Thank you.